in this next video, I want to start the math review that will continue in the next class. <clears throat> so I've broken down the mathematical concepts that will be useful for structure. Um, and there will be others that we'll come to later, but for now, for this first block of the structure semester, these are what you're going to need to, to remember. Scalars, vectors, and tensors, how to do vector addition, trigonometric ratios, so sine, cosine, tangent, and their inverses, vector decomposition, and points, lines, and planes. So we're going to start in this video specifically looking at scalars, vectors, and tensors. A scalar is a quantity along a number line. So if you could plot that number on a one-dimensional number line, then it's a scalar. So negative 7 is a scalar. The number 1 or 1 1.5, those are scalars. And so for example, the no this is the Bishop Tuff. It's a, a volcanic unit in Owens Valley, California. And all of these things that look like shadows that are the shape of lines, those are all faults. So those are all breaks in that, that Bishop Tuff unit where along that break there's been some displacement. There's been sliding of the rock on both sides of it. And we can measure that amount of, of movement. If we counted the number of faults, so we said there are 2,000 faults in the Bishop Tuff, that's a scalar the length of each fault. Let's say we measured one of the faults and it was two kilometers long. Then that length would be a scalar. Notice that you can still have units. So even though you might think of a number line as being something like this without units, it's fine for a scalar to have units. So that number of faults would be your unit and you could put a point on each one or for the length of each fault, you could say feet or meters or miles. Uh, you could have those units and that would be okay. A vector is a quantity that has a direction and a magnitude. So it's, it's not just having a unit and saying that a fault is five feet long. It's saying it's five feet long trending to the north. So it's giving it a direction and a magnitude. So, for example, the movement along a fault during an earthquake. When an earthquake happens, there's sometimes motion of one rock compared to the other. So you, you'd have this surface that's the break, and that break has allowed for this block to slide down relative to its neighbor. This green unit would continue across and would be an unbroken green line. Uh, before fault, before the earthquake, before movement, but since there has been unit or movement, it's now offset. So if we wanted to describe the way that this block has slid, we would have to have a length, the amount that it slid, and then we would have a direction associated with that, and that, that would give us a vector. Um, don't worry about this. This is just how we would represent a vector on a stereo net. But again, we, we haven't talked about stereo nets yet in this class. So this is a normal fault. If we were working with a strike-slip fault, for example, um, that vector would be close to horizontal because these, these would be sliding next to each other instead of up and down. Now just a note, if you multiply a vector by a scalar, you get another vector. So if I take this vector that's red and I multiply it by 3, I would go tip to tail 3 times, and my ending vector would be 3 times long and in the same direction, unless the scalar is negative and then the opposite direction. A basis vector is a quantity, so it's still a vector, that has a direction along an axis and a magnitude of 1. So for example, this red vector is a basis vector if it has a length of 1 and it's following the y-axis. The blue vector is a basis vector that has a length of 1 following the z-axis. And the green vector is a unit vector because it, or a basis vector because it has a length of 1 and follows the x-axis. If you've had multiple math classes before, you may have heard something called a unit vector. A unit vector has a length of 1 
a basis vector is a unit vector that's following an axis. Every vector can be described as a group of basis vectors by projecting the vector onto each axis. So let's see what that means. We're going to do this in two dimensions. Here's a vector, and this vector we would want to describe using basis vectors. So remember that there would be a little basis vector that lives here and a little basis vector that lives here of length 1 along the y-axis and another little basis vector length 1 along the x-axis. So when we say that we can describe this vector as a combination of those basis vectors, what we mean is how many basis vectors would we need to march out along the x-axis to capture the width of that vector? And how many basis vectors would we need to count up to match the height of that vector? Another way to think about it is by projecting the vector onto each axis. So if I had a flashlight and I shown my flashlight parallel to the x-axis of the vector, the shadow would be hitting the y-axis right here. And if I had a flashlight up here and I were shining that flashlight on the vector uh, vertically, so I were shining it parallel with the y-axis, it would have a shadow cast along this line. So we could write this as 5, 6.5, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6.5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, about 6.5. Or we could write this really gen generally. We could say how many units is it in the x direction? How many units is it in the y direction? We can also expand this out to three dimensions. This particular vector doesn't go into the z direction. If you imagine the z axis as going through this point and coming out toward you, this particular vector would lie flat on the xy plane. It's not raising up into the z axis at all. So we could say, how many basis vectors in the z direction do we need to describe this vector? Well, we need 0. So we can write 5, 6.5, 0. Notice that there's only one basis vector per component. So we only see one letter in the subscript. For example, here where we write 5, 6.5, we're saying that we need five units in the x direction, five base ve basis vectors in the x direction, and 6.5 in the y direction. So if we were going to describe scalars, would you need a subscript? And the subscript, again, is this little x. So here we only have one letter in the subscript. Would we need a subscript for a scalar? I hope you said no. We don't need a subscript for a scalar. And the reason is that we're only moving back and forth along one dimension. So if you thought about this as the x, well, you wouldn't need to say 5 or 10 or notate it with a subscript of x. It's understood that it's along this line. That's all that there is for a scalar. So. Let's try making this a little bit more complicated. Let's make that vector a fence. So this is now a fence. And let's make the coordinate plane a pasture. And let's stick some cows in that pasture. And what we're going to try and do now is use something called a tensor to describe a situation. So we want to be able to numerically describe what is going on here. So here's our scenario. We're going to say that the cows in the south pasture are going to charge that fence. They're going to be headed north. And the cows in the north pasture are going to charge that fence headed east. So I'm going to organize this a little bit. I'm going to put these three cows down here, and I'm going to put the four cows up here. These are charging to the east along the fence, and these cows are charging to the north along the fence. So what we could write is we could write a length of 5 to describe the fence 
going in this direction and we could say that there are three cows there that are charging the fence to the north and we could say that the that the vector or the new fence is 6.5 units in this direction and that there are four cows charging it from this direction. Now it'd be a lot easier if we just pretend that the fence has a length one. If we say that the fence has a length of one then we really don't care about the length of the fence. We care more about what the cows are doing to it. So we could just write 3, 4. Or more generally, if, if let's say we put, we could add as many cows as we want down here and as many cows as we want over here, now we could describe the situation as cows yy, cows xx. And what that means is these three cows, or any of the cows down here, they're on a line perpendicular to the y-axis, and they're headed in the y-direction. So these cows are on the x-axis, which is perpendicular to y, and they're running in the y-direction. So there's a y right there. These cows are on a line perpendicular to x, because they're on the y-axis, and they are running in the x-direction. And so notice if we have something like this, if we understand our vector is unit length one, that it's in this position, then we could describe any number of cows in this configuration and we would have a really simple way to write it. If we just make sure that our subscript says on a line perpendicular to whatever is the other axis and the direction that the cows are headed in. What if they're not all headed in the same direction, though? So, so now let's do a different scenario. We're going to have two cows in the south pasture, and we're going to make them run to that fence line headed to the west. And we'll have one cow that charges north. And then over here, let's let all four cows keep charging to the east. So we would want to have a way to write this. And so what we would write is one cow along the axis that's perpendicular to y, and it's headed in the y direction. So this is our number one that's over here, that we would have two cows sitting along the, the line perpendicular to the y axis, and they're headed to the x direction, or they're headed in the x direction. So these two cows are our two. There are no cows sitting along the line perpendicular to the x-axis that are headed in the y direction. And there are four cows that are sitting on the y-axis, which is perpendicular to the x-axis, and that are headed in the x direction. So if we have cows headed in different directions, all we need to do is expand the way that we've written this. So we can describe what that fence is experiencing. We can describe the scenario using two subscripts. On a line perpendicular to whatever that axis is, headed in the some direction. So notice though that there are two subscripts. There's two letters in this subscript rather. This is because there are two basis vectors per component. So remember, a vector has a magnitude and a direction. So for each component, we're now trying to describe a cow that's headed, one cow, so that's your magnitude, that's one thing that defines a basis vector, headed along the y direction, and one cow headed along the x direction. So we need two basis vectors to describe each component of this situation. A tensor is a mathematical object. So when I say object, I don't mean like a physical object. I mean it's a, an organized way of writing something. Think about it as uh, a cabinet that we can store our data in or we can store our, our numbers that describe our scenario in. So a tensor is a mathematical object where we use basis vectors to describe a scenario. And I say a scenario because Usually, 
um, when we're going to think about tensors and structure, we're going to describe the, the stress that a rock is feeling in a certain situation. Um, and so that's more of a scenario than, say, like a depth that a rock is sitting at. That's just a number. The rank of a tensor is the number of basis vectors we need to describe each component. So a scalar, and just to go back and clarify, the components here are the pastures. So to describe the scenario in this pasture, this component, you need two basis vectors. How many cows are headed this way? and How many cows are headed this way? And to describe this component, we need how many cows are headed this way and how many cows are headed this way. So the rank is the number of basis vectors we need to describe each component. So let's think this through. For a scalar, how many basis vectors do we need to describe a scalar? Do we need any vectors to describe a scalar? Because a scalar doesn't have a direction, so we don't need the direction part of a basis vector. And we don't really need a magnitude either, because the scalar is not a, a length necessarily, it's just a point on a line. And if we think back to the subscripts, a scalar didn't need a subscript if we wrote it in a general sense. So a scalar is a tensor of rank zero. Now for a vector, we only need one letter in the subscript. We need to describe the basis vectors for an x, y, or z direction, but we don't need multiple of those um, basis vectors to describe each particular component. So a vector is a tensor of rank 1. Our cow scenario, because we needed two basis vectors to describe each component, we had two subscripts, our cow scenario would be a tensor of rank 2. Okay, let's pretend we have a cube of rock. So we're almost to real geology now. We're almost out of the cow pasture. And sorry, guys, I live on a farm. So just get ready for farm analogies this semester. Uh, we're going to move to a cube of rock. So now we're moving in three dimensions. And so instead of, of writing our subscripts as uh, look, thinking about lines perpendicular to other lines, now we're going to say our, our little phrase is going to be acting on a plane perpendicular to blank, headed along blank, or headed in some direction. So let's pretend we have a cube of rock, and we're going to sick our cows on it. We're going to let these cows attack this rock. We're going to let the sides of this cube be length 1, and we're going to think, how could we generalize this scenario? Describe the, the anxiety that the rock is feeling because cows are running at it. How could we generalize this scenario using a tensor? and an XYZ coordinate system. So our subscripts are going to be some combination of X, Y, and Z. Let's throw a cow at this. OK. So this cow came in in this direction. It hit the block from above, and it hit in this plane. So this plane is feeling this cow smacking down on it. So if we want to describe how this plane feels, we would say that it's some cow, C, acting on a plane perpendicular to, well, this plane, this blue plane, is perpendicular to the z-axis. So acting on a plane perpendicular to z, and the cow flew in vertically. So it was headed along the z-axis. So, so we, would, we would describe that particular smackdown of the cow as being C, Z, Z. Let's try another one. The cow now zoomed in horizontally from the right. Again, it's along this plane. So in the future, we're going to talk about that shwoo feeling as being sheer. But for now, it's just movement along that plane. 
So here, it's still acting on a plane perpendicular to z, so we would fill in this blank with z, but now it's headed along the direction of the x-axis. So we would call whatever the, the cal pressure, the cal stress that this block of rock feels, we would call that c z x. So it's acting on a plane perpendicular to z, but it was headed, that cow swooped by in the x direction. So we could keep doing that. We could keep throwing cows at this cube from all different sides. We could hit right here in a plane that's perpendicular to y. We could hit over here in a plane perpendicular to x. And we could move in all of these three directions. So this is our CZZ. And we saw CZX. CZY would have been if that cow had swooped in from the front and hit right here and kept going out like that. And we can do that for each of those planes. So when we have this, even though this is a different, uh, like if we were just going to think about these as being matrices, even though this is a 3 by 3 matrix, and that last uh, cow scenario, if we go back, you might be tempted to call this a 2 by 2 matrix. These aren't really matrices. They're tensors, and they're tensors that are describing certain situations. So they're both second rank tensors, or rank two tensors, because we only need two subscripts, or two basis vectors, to describe each component. Hope that helps. In the next math review, we're going to go over trigonometric ratios and vector addition.